Okay, everybody, welcome to session 2.4. In this class session, we're going to talk about reading the tax forms that relate to nonprofit organizations. Well, to be honest, we're not going to read them in this class session, not the recorded part, but when we get together, we're going to go through a couple tax forms that I'll put up on the screen. I'll show you a 1023, and I'll show you a 990, and we'll step through, and I'll just point out the stuff that's most interesting or valuable. From this discussion, I have these three goals. I want you to know the economic costs of tax compliance for nonprofit organizations. Complying with tax, com, even though t nonprofits don't pay taxes, they pay a lot of money just to file their taxes, and we'll talk about what that means and how much money that is. I want you to understand the content and filing requirements of the IRS Form 1023, and then the same thing for the IRS Form 990. Let's talk about tax compliance. This is a really big number coming. Every year, 501c3 organizations spend about $1.37 billion on federal tax compliance. Now, to be clear, this is not money that they pay to the federal government. This is money that nonprofits pay to accountants and to lawyers just to file their taxes or comply with other tax requirements. So this is actually quite a bit of money that nonprofits have to spend in order to be tax exempt. Um, you know, obviously they would have to spend more than this if they decided to pay, if they were actually paying taxes. But what's important here is to note that it is not cheap for nonprofits to be tax exempt. It's not, it's certainly not free. It's cheaper than paying taxes, but it's not, it's not entirely free. And so saying that they're tax free is only partly true because the burden of complying with tax exemption imposes sort of, uh, well, it's, it's kind of like an informal tax. It's not a tax paid to the federal government, but it's a financial burden imposed because of the tax system. How much is $1.37 billion? Well, it, obviously, it seems like a lot of money, but let's put it into perspective with other aspects of the nonprofit economy. Um, so this is some data from 2006, and uh, as a percentage of revenue, so meaning how much money do nonprofits spend in tax compliance relative to their total income, uh, it's about a half a percent. So it turns out in terms of revenue, that's not that bad. It seems like a lot of money, $1.37 billion, but in terms of all the revenue that nonprofits bring in, they're only spending about half a percent in tax compliance. Now, um, you know, that that's more than you and I spend, though. I mean, when we file our, our, uh, our 1040, we're probably spe not spending a half a percent of our income on it. But, uh, you know, for a lot of people, uh, for a lot of companies, it might be true that they're spending half a percent because their tax returns are more complex. Um, as a percentage of contributions, meaning for every dollar donated, how much is going to pay um, how much is going to pay for filing taxes? It's about one and a half percent. So if you give a, a dollar to charity, one and a half cents of that dollar are going to go to pay the accountant or lawyer who's filing their taxes. Now you, you may not be okay with the, with this, uh, you know, because all those pennies add up, and that's a lot of good that can be done. Uh, so so that's that's how much that is relative to um, the donations we make to charities. Now. The last one is, is an interesting one. So a tax expenditure is the amount of money that the federal government goes without in order by, by virtue of making nonprofits exempt. So it's sort of like they're spending through the tax system. Rather than collecting the money and then handing it back to the nonprofits, they're just saying, you guys keep the money. Economically speaking, it's kind of like the government is spending the money by not taxing something that they could otherwise tax. Uh, now, for some of you that are very, um, very much in favor of small government, the way I'm phrasing that might raise your hackles. That's okay. I, 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 um, the the concept is an economic one. It's basically a way for economists to look at the different ways that governments encourage types of activity. And one of the ways you encourage an activity is by spending on it. Another is by not taxing it when you would otherwise tax it. But anyway, the more important question here is how much of the tax expenditure is spent on tax compliance? Well, the, the federal government gives up about $31 billion a year in revenue by not taxing nonprofit organizations. And so as a percentage of tax expenditure, the compliance costs, meaning the bills that are being sent by accountants and lawyers, is about 4.5%. So the government is saying, hey, nonprofits, you don't have to give us this $31 billion, but about 5%, almost 5% of that is going 
from is going actually to accountants and lawyers instead. And that's because of the tax system we've set up. It's because of the complexity of the 990. Uh, it's because of the complexity of the tax code as it relates to nonprofits. If we tried to get a simpler tax code, it might get cheaper. But we talked about the danger of a simple tax code, right, which is that people find loopholes and eventually the tax code gets complex again. Anyway, so so that's what it costs non the nonprofit industry to comply with tax requirements. But let's look at the actual tax requirements that are that 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 need compliance with, and and that takes us to first to Form 1023. the The Form 1023 is the form that nonprofits use to file to obtain tax exempt status. So if you do this right, you'll only ever file this form once. It's sort of like an application to be considered a nonprofit. It has to be filed within 27 months in order to be retroactive. That's a nice thing because it means that you don't have to you don't have to file until two years and three months after you've set up your nonprofit. Um, you know, it gives a lot of time for an organization to figure things out. Um, and again, that's from the date of filing. You could actually so let's say I filed within the 20 let's say I filed in the 26th month, and then it took a whole extra year to get my tax exempt status. It would still be retroactive all the way back to the beginning because it's from the date of filing that uh, that the 27 months is considered. And the nice thing, so the nice thing about that is it means that um, you know it, I'll be considered a tax exempt entity all the way back to all the way back to the day I incorporated. The 1023 is a pretty involved form. I, it didn't used to be a little over a decade ago. It was a pretty simplified one. Now it's much more complex. Um, you have to give much more narrative explanations of things. Right? It used to be you just checked a lot of boxes and filled in some lines, but now you have to include all kinds of stuff like full-on descriptions of your programs, bios of your board of directors and officers, a copy of your articles on corporation and bylaws. The truth is when I help clients uh, apply for tax exempt status, we're sending in a stack of paperwork that's about a half an inch to an inch thick, depending on the organization. And that's a lot of paperwork, but it's necessary because this is what the examiner uses to evaluate whether or not you qualify as, a, as, an, as an exempt entity. Um, one more thing to know about this 1023 is that it's a public document for as long as you are exempt. And so you need to hold on to a, your copy of this and have it ready in case people request it because the law actually requires you to provide it upon request. Um, a lot of organizations don't hold on to this. In fact, the biggest mistake is they send off their only copy. So they fill out the 1023 and all the forms, and they send that to the IRS without first making a photocopy for themselves. The IRS is not going to send this back to you. They keep it on record, and so you need to keep a copy of it for your own purposes. So that way, if somebody requests it later, they can, they can, you can give them that copy. So, so that's the first form. We're going to look at a 1023 in class together. I'm going to point out interesting things that relate to concepts we've learned about, like the organizational and operational tests. But that's the general idea. The Form 990 is the annual tax filing. This is sort of like the nonprofit version of, of your own 1040 that you file every year. So this is an annual filing, unless you are one of two things, either a church or you make less than $50,000 a year. So in either of those cases, if, uh, if you're a church or, or you make less than fifty grand a year, then you don't have to file a 990 with the IRS, at least not a regular one. If you're one of those entities, you, you, file, you do what's called a 990N filing, which is, they call it an e-postcard filing. Basically, you log into the IRS website and you check a box that says, yeah, we still exist. That's really kind of the extent of it. And, and the IRS has started doing that because for a long time there were a bunch of organizations, small ones that were never filing, that had long since dissolved, but they were still on the books as far as the IRS was concerned, even though these organizations had ceased to exist. And so the IRS changed the law in 2000, well, Congress changed the law in 2006 so that now people have to file um, at least this website sort of check the box kind of filing. Uh, if you stop doing this for three years, then you'll automatically lose your tax exemption. We talked about this in class that a whole bunch of nonprofits, a little over 10% nationwide, lost their tax exempt status because they weren't filing their 990N. In fact, some of those organizations weren't even filing a regular 990, which even though they should have been. So, all right. Another point about the 990 is that um, if you're not familiar with the concept of a statute of limitations, let me explain that really quickly. Basically, a statute of limitations says that when you um, when something bad happens, there's a limit of time from the date it happens to when somebody can bring this 
an action against you in court, whether it's a crime or a civil claim. Usually when some bad thing has occurred, there's a statute of limitations that says you have to sue on this within the time period identified in the law. So, for example, in most states, the statute of limitations on a broken contract is three years. So if somebody breaks a contract, the other party has to sue them within three years. If they don't, then um, they can't bring their, their lawsuit anymore. The IRS has a statute of limitations imposed against them on 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 filings. So they can oppose a filing or they can reject a filing or they can come back and claim that a filing was fraudulent as long as the as long as they make that claim within a 3-year period. If they don't, if they fail to file a, a claim within 3 years, then the statute of limitations has run, that's what they call it, or expired and therefore the claim can't be made. Well, this is true of all your tax filings. So if the IRS doesn't make a claim against you within 3 years, then uh, then you're scot-free as far as the statute of limitations goes. Well, here's the thing. If you never file, then the, then the clock never starts because the IRS can only make claims, the IRS can make claims against you for things that you didn't, um, for things that you dishonestly represented in your filing. Well, if you never file, then the IRS, then the statute of limitations never starts running. And so they can always come after you for failing to file. And so make sure you're always filing a tax return no matter what, because as you do, um, you, you limit the ability of the IRS to come back and challenge things later. Uh, now, this isn't to encourage you to be dishonest. This is just a lawyer saying, hey, this is another way to be safe and protect your organization, especially um, where maybe uh, the IRS might misunderstand or disagree with your charitable purpose. And that's been known to happen in the past, even for very noble causes. The last point to make about the 990 is that it is just like the 1023, it's public, but the 1023 is public for as long as you exist. The 990 is only public going three years backwards. Now, this is important because in the 990, you could share information that you don't want the public to know and that you don't have to include on the 990. The 990, we're going to, again, we're going to sort of look at it together in class. There's a bunch of opportunities to provide all sorts of information that's not required. Um, and, but sort of the way the questions are worded would encourage you to share information, but you may not have to share that information. If there's anything you feel like, like a trade secret in the way you operate, for example, you'd want to keep it quiet. And so you don't have to put it into your 990. Uh, and so if you don't, because you don't have to, don't put it in there. Uh, only include the things that you need to because this information is public. Anyway, so that's it. 12 minutes, not bad. I'll see you all in class.